Hello and welcome to this fourth installment of the WAC lecture series. With us today, we have the editor in chief of Aureus Press, Mr. Brendan Hurd, um, who is a writer and a thinker and an all around bang up chap. Um, have, we have him here today to give a lecture entitled Good Modernism versus Bad Modernism. So, with that, Brendan, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. I'm back to lecture you on good, good modernism versus bad modernism. So, I wanted to talk about this as an extension of the last lecture because it is something I get. It's something I may have even almost, I'm not going to say I changed my mind on, but I, if I was writing my book again today, I wrote it like several years ago now, I might have addressed it. I wouldn't say differently, but in more detail. So this is my chance to do so now, because it seems to have, be a confusing point for a lot of people. And a lot of you, sons of bitches, have whined over the years about how, in, in a misunderstanding, I think, you because you, you, you like... Art Deco or in Futurism and things. I like these things too. You get confused when someone says modernism is the root of the evil here. And um, it's very, it's not, it's, you shouldn't be blamed at all because it is confusing. And uh, this is why I must try to explain in great detail exactly where the root of the deceit is here. And it lies in modernism for sure. But it's all, it's a word game. It's playing games with terminology and many, many lies and many, many if I, ideally, let's say, I would invent new terms, and I would say, I wouldn't just say you have to choose, we, we have to categorize it as good modernism and bad modernism, I would invent some new word altogether. And, but I mean, that's a step too far. And that's, in some ways, it gets even more confusing. So um, I'll start by explaining modernism for anyone. I'll, I'll go with the Wiki Wikipedia description of modernism for anyone who's just gonna, just getting into this problem now. And really, this is a problem for people who want to investigate, people who have already sensed that something's wrong with art today and want to know, want to get some idea where, where, where it went wrong or why is it so different than how it was. So modernism is both a philosophical... See, this is, this is the other thing. They've drawn in everything around them and because they're liars, people who control media and uh, our art history textbooks and so forth, or Wikipedia, they will make assumptions and draw in uh, people posthumously and say they are modernist. And this is where it gets very confusing. So even to say it's philosophical is to me a bit of a stretch because most, most when you people think of modernist philosophers, they think say maybe Nietzsche and Heidegger, these are people who have been labeled as modernist posthumously. So they may not agree and it's sort of part of the trick, but I won't get into that until the end. So sorry. Modernism is both a philosophical and arts movement that arose from broad transformations in Western society during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The movement rejected a desire for the creation of new forms of art, philosophy, and social organization, which reflected the newly emerging industrial world, including features such as urbanization, new technologies, and war. Artists attempted to depart from traditional forms of art, which they considered outdated and obsolete. The poet Ezra Pound in 1934 injunction, make it new was the touchstone of the movement's approach. Now, I'm surprised, actually, that they still allow the likes of Ezra Pound to be in the culminating summary of modernism on the Wikipedia, uh, considering he was notoriously, um, I guess, anti-Semite. Many of them have been labeled as anti-Semite uh, since. Even uh, Kandinsky, who, when I first read about him, I believe was, uh, when I first read his biography, I was told he was Jewish. And then later on, no, he's an anti-Semite. But I mean, these are labels that a moder an artist today would not be able to survive, but somehow it's still okay for once you once you're in the the halls of classics like Ezra Pound, they can't completely uh, cancel you, I guess. But so that gives you an idea of what they mean by modernism. They mean a new uh, movement for our time that isn't industrial or post-industrial, and it's in the wording there. What they really mean is that it's sort of re a rejection of tradition in a certain degree. Uh, not just for industrial reasons, but in um, a wild uh, newness and a search for newness, which is fine, which is what the art movement should do. But you'll see that in their fixation on this is where they've gone wrong. And they've led, led us into this trap where we can't escape. And frankly, formal art institutions probably will never escape, uh, not until something more radical happens. 
and I'll try to explain the ins and outs of this. So where do I start? Let's see. Yeah, so modernism, 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 modernism. So it is that early 20th century, late 19th century, when things were getting industrialized. It wasn't just the uh, cre the creation of things like photography, which obviously affected painting. There was movements that were emerging influenced by technology, but also by uh, radical changes uh, around in, in, in culture, mostly in, uh, Western culture. There was what we have to label good, good modernism and bad modernism, even though there's outliers between the two that mix together. So we, let's say we have futurism, which most people know about. And in my mind is deeply flawed, frankly, for the most part. Um, most of what's good about it is found in the wider movement of Art Deco, which was kind of that techno neoclassicism in a way which led to the sort of 50s streamlining of trains and vehicles that was pretty cool buildings um so it's related to all that but there was a lot of desperate bourgeois not bourgeois i suppose almost almost overly anti-bourgeois uh attempts at newness and futurism and it caught up a lot of people of the time even people i would be uh, great fans of like even say the likes of um Julius Evola, although he considered himself, I think, a dataist, which is even, even more ridiculous. And his paintings were truly awful, to be honest. As good a writer and brilliant mind as he was, his paintings were terrible. But um, so futurism is an example of, say, a, a modern a modernist movement, a modernist movement that's both, to me, good and bad, but most people would label it as a good one. In the core of modernism, in what it really is about, and why I must, so when I was writing my book, my decision was I could either keep the label of modernism and say, okay, modernism is the root evil, which it is what I truly overall believe. And I was going to even say, oh, it's really and just take postmodernism and say it's actually more postmodernism. Modernism that's the more truly abstract, just uh, dysfunctional, uh, individualist problem. But that would be that wasn't entirely true. If I chose either path, there, I have outliers in between that float. I would have to. There's a group I would have to excise from modernism. Let's say, like obviously Picasso and Duchamp, etc., and put them push and say, no, these are actually postmodernists and leave Art Nouveau, Art Deco, the good modernism, elements of futurism, um, um, the, the good modernism anyways, I would have to like find a way to divide them and draw my own lines, either make new terms or, or um, you know, make, make the terms that exist more starkly to blame for what they are. So, the best way I have at the moment is to say there's good modernism and bad modernism. Now, I didn't necessarily, I, I alluded to that in my book. I said, uh, trying to distinguish the movements, but I did very singularly blame modernism overall. Now, this is, this is very confusing and difficult because, like I said, not only were the movements of the time, which were modern in their time, and everyone, a lot of people just have the pro don't even get past the, the problem of the fact that modern is in the word modernism, and they just think it means contemporary, per, you know, progress, new things. There's also the problem that it uh, that they posthumously grabbed all these other things. So there was the movements of the time, which were, I think, unique and happening or, happening organically, such as Art Nouveau or Jugendstil, as it's called. And there was after the fact they went. If you go and look at the definition of modernism now, they'll reach as far back as. Um, romanticism and they'll say this is obviously modernist because and then there's the most loose and glib reason ever that they were rebelling they were rebellious for their time and being individualistic so they can just go back in the past and say actually they're modernists like they did with Nietzsche that they do with romanticism anything that predates what they were really doing they will lie about because they're liars and they will draw it into the definition and this is where it really becomes confusing and where everyone butts heads and becomes comes at odds over this but I believe at the core of modernism, really, of what we call, have to call modernism, because most of its efforts are controlled by these people and moved in that direction towards the absurdity, towards what we have now is the final, I don't know if it's final, hopefully final phase of this modern art, which goes nowhere, which is a trap, um, where we are trapped in the 1990s forever, uh, supposedly. Um, that is really, uh, it boils down, uh, I've said this many times, to the art criticism of Clement Greenberg. Who really invented the language of uh, explaining away the scribbles and the boxes uh, all this boils down we can bring all this visual art metaphor 
uh, boil it down to painting. I'm obviously talking about architecture, sculpture, everything, even broadly literature and uh, music and everything. But you can use painting as a metaphor. And indeed, it was the first one that they really commandeered and ruined. And the people responsible to this day hold a tight grip on the definition of these things and want them to remain ruined and spoiled and useless. And it's, you might say, to me, it was the first step in the true cultural decline of the West that we see sort of dissipating all about us now. But the first thing they decided to wreck was art. And they did it by the with the language of Clement Greenberg. And it, it's something they still hold on to preciously now as their, as many ways, their number one weapon. And most people are utterly clueless about it. Most people don't even want to think about art nowadays because it's a confusing mess. But uh, in, in his writing, in his criticism, I mean, he had a lot of help. There was Steinberg and Rosenberg and um, obviously Peggy Guggenheim was a big force here, as well, enormous force in this. All, all the entire institution was taken over and the media was influenced by these people. And then the art pop stars, Picasso and Duchamp and um, what's his name? What's the, what's the architect? Corbusier and these people. But um, in the language that he invented and was adopted, there was really... A, um, yeah, I have an example of it here to give you an idea. Let's see. Where do I have it? So he had a lot of little sayings and things to say, and it sounds it, 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 this is typical of the art language that gets used. They say these wonderful sounding, sort of philo philosophically sounding things that really generally say nothing, or they're just sort of like a nice way to say, let's do away with standards. And let's do it with tradition and let's go with pure newness and individuality, uh, pure expression, really, which is what most people think art is today. So here's an example of his talk that he invented that you hear anywhere you, anytime you go into a fine art gallery now, you, you still hear similar talk. Um, art is a matter of strictly, of strictly, is a matter strictly of experience, not of principles. That's one of his quotes. Here's another one. The essence of modernism lies in the use of the characteristic methods of discipline to criticize the discipline itself. So this kind of confusing talk, it draws you in. You think, oh, that's interesting. Oh, won't, won't I be a fancy man and understand this this uh, <laughs> and understand this fancy in, in, intellectualism of this man? And really, you just find yourself going in circles if you actually read it and just use common sense. Um, not in order to subvert it, but in order to entrench it more firmly. That's my dog. Uh, more firmly in its area of competence. <laughs> like, what's he, it's so stupid. What are you saying? Modernism used art to call attention to art. Modernism used art to call attention to art. So, you know, <laughs> right there. What is he telling you? He's making it to, that's the kind of attitude to art that really, really defines people going into a gallery and looking at a blank canvas or a collection of, you know, garbage. You know, you're being called attention to the art. And it's a funny old world he's invented. And once you step into it, and once, as we have, and not, we, first we dabbled in it, because, you know, it didn't... It didn't instantaneously take over everything. It's really only fairly recently that art has been completely consumed by these ideas, where you expect to go into a gallery and just see some funny, goofy, gimmicky thing. And that's the art then. And like to see something traditional of just like, you know, in, traditional in a folky or beautiful way or by, by traditional techniques strictly without a gimmick is like unheard of. And you'd be like, what, you know, what's going on here? Um, so what else does he say that he says? The limitations that constitute the medium of painting, the flat surface, the shape of the support, the properties of the pigment came to be regarded as positive factors and were acknowledged openly. So, you know, it's very clever with his talk and just making this garbage talk sound like wonderful. Um, but really, you know, so that's the core of what I would consider modernism. So there's all these other, even now people are listening to this and objecting and thinking, how can you say, you know, I love this writer and this modernist. I love Hemingway or I love this and that. But all these things have been very loosely jumbled together and labeled as modernism. When at their core is this mission of this talk, strictly in the fine in, in the sense of the fine art and the institution, we're talking for straight from Greenberg to the Guggenheim and outwards. Like it's a very controlled thing. And these people, you know, <laughs> how can I say this? They may not even they may have a certain iconoclasm about them. And there's, re there's reasons why they actually even despise the, uh, what would be traditional Western art in its uh, skillful representation of things as being, a, you know, it's one of its chief merits. So they have kind of a bias against that, probably right out of the gate, let's say. 
uh, on top of other of other reasons, perhaps for wanting to uh, minimize its influence. But anyways, so that's my explanation of what's at the core of modernism. Why I feel is to blame because without this talk, before that, there was traditional art. You had romanticism and you had Art Nouveau happening organically. They would organically evolve out of the previous movement. And Art Nouveau was moving into Art Deco. But these things kind of had, especially Art Nouveau and Art Deco, they had very short lives and they were cut short, in my opinion, from where they were evolving by this scam, which kind of subsumed everything else. And in the traditional um, evolving, uh, organically evolving art movement, uh, evolution of art, let's say, the there is no need to focus or to fixate on the individualism and the individual individualism came out of it anyways it was uh, romanticism happened without any of this talk of or and this talk of abandoning standards or abandoning tradition when really it was a, it was always a symbiotic thing where you're obviously your individualism is going to come through but you can remain you have to have the tradition and what comes before and looking backwards and Ezra Pound would have known that and Ezra Pound spoke of that actually in the very book that they mentioned is the the um, modern sort of modernist manifesto to make it new even to make it new he would talk about while we do want to be new and like fiery in our newness you have to maintain that link with the past but secretly you know they were sort of hijacked and people like Kandinsky had no intention of uh, retaining any link to anything you know when you're just doing Getting away with your random scribbles and things, your I know you I know they think they're launch, a launch pad into some uh, open vista where without limits, but it turns out to be a trap. As we can see, if you anybody who ponders, it looks around them and sees the modern world of Western art and like wonders why it is how it is, you uh, you really have to think about this and like why is it so hopeless? And why can't it go anywhere? Why is it trapped in itself? It's because these values. The individualist value, the values of individual expression completely subsumed everything else, utterly. So uh, to get back to my, that's my roundabout, maybe complex, I don't know, explanation of what I think of modernism. But um, in terms of make it new, I've got a quote from his, from Ezra Pound's Make It New. Or not a quote, for, sorry, a description of it. Make It New refers to Ezra Pound's modernist imperative. The artist must break, uh, I think that's a quote from it. The artist must break with the formal and contextual standards of their contemporaries in making works fundamentally individual. And that's true. Um, these new modern works cannot be wholly autonomous, however, as they must consider the aesthetics of the past in the context of the present moment. Now, that's something Greenberg would never say. In fact, everything he says would work against that in a secret language kind of way. Uh, so Make It New became a model of change, of renaissance and renewal, in which the new is not simply a return to the old, uh, but Ezra does add in that it must draw on the works of what has come before, making it new in the process of historical recycling, quotation, and rearrangement. So that's really how art moves and evolves anyways, is that you take, you're influenced by what came before you. Usually a couple of, say, different artists came before you, and you sort of recombine them in a new, I, I did this in my last lecture, I remember talking about this. So, I mean, that's, that's it. That's what it is and how it works. When you fixate, when you do away completely with tradition, and you fixate on individualism wholly, then you are entering into the world of destruction. Because as individual units, we are much, much less than we are as a continuous genealogical uh, bloodline working towards a singular idealism, let's say. Um, so as a list of, uh, a quick list of say, what I, would, I already did this, I think, but anyways, bad modernism, bad modernists, I would say are Greenberg, Pollock, Duchamp, Corbusier, Guggenheim, Steinberg, Gropius. Um, these are like the big stars. Did I say um, Picasso, who just obviously farcical Picasso, even though he started out as a good painter. Yes, everybody knows that. Um, good modernists, I would say. Ezra, Ezra Pound, Stanislav uh, Sukowski. Uh, some elements of the futurists. Well, again, I find them, uh, though everyone's, a lot of people are great fans of them. Um, some of it is very weak, in my opinion. So their graphic design, their, uh, the painting was. Uh, not great, I don't, I don't think. But I mean, that's maybe uh, you know a bit more subjective and personal. Uh, obviously, Art Nouveau it was spectacular and uh, should have had much more in it. And uh, in fact, I think if someone went back and took great inspiration from Art Nouveau and tried to take it in a new direction, that would be one of the last proper evolved living movements that we had. 
uh, Art Deco was really the last, I suppose. And it was very industrial. And it was effective and good. I, I think it was very good. But, uh, um, yeah, so those are good modernist movements. And so like Stanislav uh, Sukowski is a good example of a good modernist. He's very quirky, almost kind of futurist, but he's very, and it's just his own guy and very talented. And he really much understood both the duality of being individualistic, but also having to re, uh, recycle and retain and take what came from you in the past, specifically your own past, from what was handed down to you. Uh, he understood that. I mean, his drawings and paintings in particular, I think, were very good. Just his even sketches. I really like his sketches. He's, he's, he's known more for his sculptures. So. Also a slightly controversial guy that's eked through that one. <laughs> but uh, yes, and he has a quote. I put Rodin in one pocket, Michelangelo in another, and I walked towards the sun, which is great. And he was just a truly, a true artist. And in, in the modern sense, he understood what he is and what he should be. He wasn't just working against things like you know, say the Guggenheim just, oh, the Guggenheim and the arts institutions will only promote continually the most flagrant offenders of pure expression and individualism without any trace of tradition. You cannot even become close to showing tradition in these because they've managed to control everything through through the introduction and popularity initially of Greenberg's talk and just by gradually sort of taking over that way. So modernism really as a term and a movement initially and should be applied to visual art, specifically painting and sculpture, you know, visual arts, although it's, it's come to in the lies after it's been, it's been successful as a movement. As I said, they lie and they rewrite history as they always do. And they draw in posthumously all these other people. So, you know, they've drawn in all sorts of writers. And I mean, there were arguably, there were musicians and writers at the time that were trying to be new and modern E and, Figuring out, figuring out a new, radically new way to do their art. And a lot of it was bullshit, and some did a good job. Those with uh, those that were more grounded did a good job. So, in the terms of writers, let's say, see, I would say the good ones are not the ones you would expect to hear because people have been kicked out of the instant. People have been booted out of the the halls of fine art, let's say, and aren't allowed to be considered fine artists that had to do more commercial art, art who were really, I would say, the next link in the chain of genius from the people that were before them. So you would say, I would say, the uh, bad modernist writers would be Joyce and Samuel Beckett and people like this. Terrible, in fact. I like really miserably bad. Joyce, I can't even stand him for a second. Like that, you know, piece of shit. <laughs> but um, the real, uh, I think, the real modernist writers and um, that were good would be... Um, Lovecraft, Tolkien, uh, Howard, people like this that had to write in pulps and like that were not seriously considered, but even though they're very lasting impressions, much more uh, vast and effective than I think the former. And there's people that straddle the line in between, like say Hemingway and uh, that crowd, uh, T.S. Eliot and all that, who were trying to be modern and were had a certain effectiveness. Uh, Hemingway is mostly kind of crap, I think. Although I did like um, <sighs> For Whom the Bell Tolls was kind of good. I liked that book. Um, but he was just doing his kind of gimmicky, I'm just going to say, I'm going to be the anti Edgar Allan Poe and say as few words as possible kind of thing. And, you know, it was all right. But, and he would be sort of in between, like I said, in between, like there's so many outliers. This is the other confusing thing in trying to delineate a good and bad modernism, all in the effort just to point out that modernism was a bit of a mistake and that we've been lied to. If you want to, again, pinpoint where fine art has gone wrong and wonder and like look for a source as to what happened really it began with kandinsky in the 19th century he did not get very far he was not super effective with his little squiggles and his uh lines and boxes and circles it was not supremely effective until greenberg invented the language to really make him sound like a genius uh in the 20 uh, like whatever it was 20 30 years later more longer i think so and then he became the big superstar i believe there was a few others of his time that tried to do stuff like that but again, even Kandinsky didn't uh, really get much anywhere. Expressionism really was the first kind of goofy abstract, just like random stuff where you, where you cannot tell um, with any certainty that you're witnessing any kind of mastery of craft, genius of craft. That's where you must also, that's a sure sign evidence that you're, you're dealing with modernist deceit is where that has gone out the window, where, where there's a possibility that a child has done it. <laughs> you, you really have to uh, use common sense. Um, yeah, so I was talking about the writers. 
Um, yeah, so according to, say, Sukowski, he would say, if you want to create new things for this world, never listen to anybody. You have to suck your wisdom, all the knowledge, from your thumb, your own self. And <laughs> that's you know, sounds very individualistic. Uh, but you can see that about him in particular. He really did rely on his own intuition. And he had a good, strong intuition. I believe because he had a proper academic, he was one of the last people to get a proper academic training in a proper atelier you know, um, at the end, before the, before that, before the guilds and everything were swept away in our industrial sort of corporatized world. So he had that retinue of skills that that provides in the background while he was relying entirely on himself to come up with this. And he's right though. This is one thing that artists today who are trying not to be modernist or postmodernist, whatever we have to call people. I don't even know what to call them today. They have all these movements, names, conceptualism, etc. But it's all just the same kind of garbage. I always that's why I always just try to say it's modernist. Even though again, it, but, but this is my whole problem is that uh, you know, right away you have to say, but I don't mean Art Nouveau and these other good modernists. But you know, if I had a term that would just encompass the thing entirely, it'd be great, but I don't really, so I have to say that. But oh shit, what was I saying? Uh uh, Zukowski, whatever, yeah, but uh, he, and he would call Picasso pick as like call him an ass, and he certainly had an understanding of people that were pulling everyone's leg, or that were not, that were hoodwinking everybody. And you must believe it is a great deceit. You must understand that a great lie has been perpetrated and continues to be. Um, yeah, I know it's sort of all encompassing, and that's the only way through it is to make these delineations using not only common sense but trying to source where, where and when people have lied. Um, so, what was I going to say about him though before? I don't remember now. Um, yeah, so they, once they control the label of what art is, which they did, then they, by labeling it and saying art is individual expression and virtually nothing else, you know, Greenberg went so far as to say there's no need for standards in art, basically beyond what he says there, as long as you're focusing on the art itself. That's why you go into a, a gallery and you see, like, uh, you know, just it's a, a canvas painted blue. It's that he's trying to draw your attention to the fact that you're looking at art or something. And that's the, that's supposed to be the high philosophy of, of what you, of your activity. Oh, Jeff, you're here. Yeah. Everything all right? I, yeah, yeah, everything's good. I just had a question, actually, that oh, I yeah. thought of while you were uh, speaking and... Um, so you were, you were saying there that, you know, you, you were saying you wish you had a word for it to kind of distinguish between the the good uh, modernism and the bad modernism, right? And yeah. it made me think, I, I was just, I mean, do we kind of need, you were saying that, uh, what was his name, Clement Greenberg was kind of one of the main architects of this language that made this stuff that actually wasn't that great, made it seem like it was brilliant. So I was just curious, do you think that we need to have our own lexicon to understand, you know, for the kind of art that's going to be, or that is being made and is going to be made, you know, in the million oh, we do, yeah. right now? Yeah, we do for sure. I mean, they invent whatever words they want. They invent abstract expressionism, conceptualism, um, all their little, you know, they just invent these words. I don't, I'm not sure how it works though. Like if I can just... Maybe I should have, and maybe just through my book, I could have invented a word and it would be widely used. I don't know. I use I use the word gimmick. I kind of came up with using that and I focused on that. So you could say gimmick modernism versus regular modernism. But nice. I'm not sure how effective that is. Or, you know, these things take a little organic life of their own. If a word starts getting widely used, it's almost out of, it's certainly out of my control. I don't know. Someone, they just it just starts happening. If there's a general realization that it needs a label, a label will arise, I think. Yeah, I um, mean, I think that's, I th it seems to me that we do kind of need our own, uh, you know, c concepts and kind of uh, language lexicon around, you know, because basically whoever's controlling that is kind of controlling the narrative around it, right? So they were able to create mm -hmm. a narrative around the kind of art that was being created and they supported it and then convinced a lot of people like this is legitimate and this is good, you know, and getting us to where we are now. So, yeah, I was I was just curious about that, I think. Um, and yet it's kind of tricky because it's like, uh, I mean, do you do that self-aware? Do you just start yeah, doing yeah. it and assert it? Or, do, you know, does this happen organically? <laughs> this is it. I'm, I'm saying right now, this is the word. Right, exactly. Yeah, Make the declaration and then hopefully it'll just, boom, just start catching fire and people will start using it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, you can see it's a tricky thing to even try to explain. Yeah, like, but they're not afraid. This this. This is like people get offended or not offended, but you know they wonder, get confused and upset because 
like so and so and he's a modernist like i said but they'll just take anybody from the past it's the same with like the um i talk about in the book the uh turner prize which is like this absolutely horrendously stupid british art contest usually just it winds up winds up being a bunch of like arranged mannequins or just like literally piles of garbage or whatever named after um turner the greatest landscape pa painter probably of all time as though he would just love this you know he's got his name on it it's like what they did with Di we're doing with disney like old you know they still call disney as though old walt old walt would be just uh, enraptured about them going around you know talking about sex to kids or whatever they're doing now they're grooming kids and shit <laughs> you know and they still call it disney his name's on it <laughs> right you yeah know, i mean it's, it's really shameful like it is but they have no shame so no. yeah it's like a hijacking of these things but it's interesting it seems like once these institutions are hijacked i i kind of am of the opinion that i don't know if you can really re-hijack them and clean it out or is it just like do we need just need to kind of reform or make things anew that's kind of what i lean towards because it's like you know how do you how do you fix that once it's so off the rails like disney's a good example it's so corrupted as an organization you know and uh, it's unfortunate but like i don't even know where you would begin to to write that ship you know yeah my my inclination as i said is that it's over and that they're trapped forever yeah in a um in a kind of trap for your mind um which i'm going to get into now actually which is more my sort of my concluding remarks on this are uh, which okay. i'll get into uh, I will I will let you get to it. One quick thing. There was a question. I think this, yeah. So Kingdom of Vinland over on YouTube said, so was the evolution like this? Art Nouveau, Art Deco, 50s American retro futurism. Yes, yeah, sort of. Um, this is what I'm going to get into as well. Like, these are the two things. This, these, Those two things and sort of modernist philosophy are what I'm going to conclude with now, actually. Yeah. All right, so perfect. You've asked exactly what I was going to say anyways. So, um, let me just see my little notes and make sure there wasn't something else I wanted to say about that. Oh, it's another quick quote from Greenberg. He called Immanuel Kant the first real modernist. There's a great example. You know, Kant was, I may not agree with Kant completely, but he's been labeled a modernist. He'll show up in Wikipedia maybe as, water, as a modernist because they've said he's a modernist. He's, he's been dead for, you know, hundreds of years. Doesn't matter. Um, so, yes, I was going to say, um yeah so yeah it went from art, art nouveau to art deco and then around the art deco period it really got more confused it was bauhaus which kind of got started to get a bit more kind of freaky more towards the corbusier a kind of architecture we really got a nice taste of um yes uh, after the war let's say um which is the kind of tip typical communist block tenement uh, cement housing uh you know what do you call them? Industrial hive that we are now quite accustomed to um, architecturally. And so that kind of ruined our deco and it kind of not even people think it's just a matter of expense all the time. And it's not because they spend a horrendous, you wouldn't believe the money they spend on these things sometimes. And then, then they're dysfunctional and they start falling apart anyways, because they're, you know, shoddily built because for um, sort of other reasons. Um, but they know the design is very intentional. That's what they want. It's what they think is good. Um, but this was the hype. This is to do with those weird twisted values that Greenberg introduced where you, the, the only thing you can't be is in any way traditional. So you have to keep being kind of offensively jarringly new and some or a feeling of being like radically new uh, while having nothing to do with traditional building, which really encompassed such a broad and beautiful uh, heritage of, uh, you know, excellent ways to build things. Um, so that's, yeah, it kind of got ruined along the way, say through the fifties, but there was, See all the all the while, this is this is how I see it happening. Is all the while through that period of the twentieth century, the um, they gradually worked and worked away and getting more control of other things after they took control of art, let's say. But even then, there was a popular art, which people demanded, and and it was good, really overall. Maybe it was like influenced and cheapened in many ways, but there was there was like I have great fondness for that kind of sixties lounge pad conversation pit kind of uh, design interior design kind of thing even though a lot of it's plastic and i wouldn't agree with that kind of that part of it but I, there's a there's an ethos to it there's a um, an aesthetic to it which is all encompassing which is what all the other real movements were if you see an art nouveau house a proper one from the day like everything was considered down to the cutlery it was art nouveau style and people went out of their way when we had that kind of when we weren't so caught up in individualism 
and it was very important how you dressed and how everything was around you and you had a sense of order you took your interior design and how you dressed in your house and every little thing very seriously aesthetically and it was a unifying idea of having an overall aesthetic so even so you say people would maybe disagree that that kind of 60s 50s uh pop um style of furniture and stuff you know maybe some people like it some people don't. i think at least it is um aesthetically um um unifying and noticeable and completely individual and i thought it was good in, in my own way but that's that's kind of like a pop art that was happening at the same time you know in the higher echelons you would be more you would still be just you know pushing at that time especially at that time that's when they started with like say performance art and you'd have the likes of um uh, what's her name what's the woman who would get naked and pull things out of her vagina and genius artist you know these uh what is her name hold on i must have it here somewhere uh, eves klein was her name yes eves klein <laughs> she was famous for doing stuff like so that's that's what it in the you'd go into like a you might go pay for a fancy art school or go to a fancy gallery and that's the kind of thing you would be expected to see meanwhile in the pop culture things were still interesting so even say people people get down on the hippies and stuff but i always think the hippies were kind of a interesting resurgence inside of kind of an art nouveau kind of attitude to the world they certainly had good music and good style and there was good things about them that wasn't all bad but they were hijacked i think as well and they took that chance to say ah an another newness another rebellious individuality we can steer towards in this direction and they certainly did and that really was the final one that really put us over the edge because it wasn't so much then or that time i don't think it was really in the 80s when the hippies became older and became yuppies that kind of final materialist stage set in and the all the sense of aesthetics and everything was finally washed up and gone and there was only really the drab affordability of the corbusier industrial estate and uh, even the cars started to look crap and there was all sense of aesthetics were then really lost uh, i won't say forever but for for the immediate you know many decades and maybe maybe for many more this is where we're officially in the trap of being anti-aesthetic in every possible way at all times where we cannot make really a nice thing only by accident now and then <laughs> um and that really was that period i think where we like i said at the beginning we stepped into the 1990s and we never again left. it's never really left 1990s it's been one long episode of friends ever since really so um what was the other question that was I was going to talk about the philosophy of it. Jeff, you might want to come back in and re remind me your question again, because I answered the other guy's question. What was yours? Oh, mine was just about the language. I think you already answered mine. Right. So right. Okay. I, I think that was the only Was there two questions from other people? Um, no, it was mostly just the guy was asking about the, the kind of the flow of the different uh, eras there. <clears throat> the art yeah, I feel like I've missed something, but I'll, I'll continue anyway. Sorry. Yeah, I feel like I missed something. Maybe it'll, it'll come back. Okay. But, but um, yeah, I really think where they, um, I'll carry on here, where they overset the bounds, and this really actually confuses a lot of people too, and kind of annoys me uh, even more, is when they started to draw philosophers and philosophy into modernism and associate them. Again, generally posthumously, or if they weren't so, they would be sort of go along with it. And what, whatever anyone thought it really was at the time, it was just sort of being the new thing. But this is where you get the, uh, particularly Nietzsche and Heidegger, I think, are, are the biggest ones associated with this. And they associated in a kind of, as radical individuals. Heidegger had this idea of being in time, which was very, I think, individualistic and against the, it was against sort of Platonic metaphysics, let's say, in the sense that being and sort of radical individualism, what Nietzsche's sort of, what Nietzsche might relate to his will to power were sort of contra to the sense of duty to time and the past and metaphysics which encompassed uh, a history and going forward beyond your own individualism beyond your life even which i would agree, I, I would argue you know in their in their philosophy to that extent you know that's fine they were both very clever and very good but i don't think they uh, can ever be wholly contra to to the metaphysics or the the uh the larger picture outside individualism as they would like to be and that a lot of the explanations to their 
problems lie in giving yourself up to that longer picture of life beyond your life of your offspring and your and your ancestors um so monarchs even go so far they not only nietzsche but like fyodor uh dostoevsky is listed as a precursor to modernism <laughs> it's always a precursor to our movement because you know because he also was a uh, individualistic or had his own ideas or you know they just take anybody they like if they <laughs> it, it doesn't matter you you know so then you're so you they list him alongside greenberg with a stupid talk or rosenberg or guggenheim and he's one of them he's not around to object yeah um so yes Like on Wikipedia, you'll find like Arnold Schoenberg compared to T.S. Eliot right alongside, um, you know, Ezra Pound will be compared to uh, Rauschenberg who didn't, he didn't even paint his canvases. He just put up like a white canvas. And, uh, you know, by this association by name that goes on there by just by being able to put them together and saying in your description, oh, these, these were all, these, these are all, um, you know, people on the same working on the same level and working together, and it's just not true. Like they're not necessarily anything to do with each other at all. And one is against and suppressing and gleefully destroying art and keeping it trapped in the 1990s forever, as I said, where nothing you can notice nothing really how hard it is to innovate. There's innovation through the internet and through new things happening there. Let's say memes and things are like a new art, but that's kind of like a whole other thing. And maybe that's the only avenue we have for art in many ways. I mean, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm talking over the internet instead of painting it, a painting. If I could paint, you know, I've got paintings laying around, which I can do, but I don't know. I don't, I might, I get some use out of them, but I'm not about to, uh, you know, get uh, a show with the Guggenheim. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in terms of cultural output, you know, there used to be a fantastic unending array of potential things we could seemingly create, TV shows, stories, books. We can still create books are one of the few things you still have available to write and to do stories. And books. Um, it's difficult maybe to find your audience. But, and you can do a certain amount of illustration and painting, but uh, generally speaking, because it's all locked down and they're trapped in their world, in the institution level, they're, they can't escape from the maze in their mind of thinking that art is, is what it is. And so they'll just stand there and they'll go to the galleries watching someone pull something out of their ass or whatever. And they'll just never get tired of that, I guess. But they're trapped there forever until something overturns the whole thing, like fundamentally. I think at this stage, I used to think maybe there's a way to talk them out of it or pull things back or say, look, you've been lied to, at least in this regard. Can't you, can you at least have some element of tradition or, you know, not just be, it's not just pure expression all the way through. But then you can see, as we can see with other institutions, more recently, it's all part of a, a sweeping downward purge of culture generally that began with visual art and painting and encompassed everything. And, uh, you know, whether it's pure chaos or purposely driven plus chaos, it can be hard to say, but it's, there's a purpose to it, a purposefulness to it for sure. And uh, you can't, I don't, I, I can't see a true art returning on a large, larger scale, significant scale without large redirection of culture. And I'd say it's not possible. And to people on mass have an understanding, but it, that would involve rejecting the talk and the lies of Greenberg and people like that to acknowledge and understand and say, okay, and be willing to stand up and say, okay, I'm not going to put up with the painting that's just blue in, in the gallery. Cause it's so easy to say, oh, I'll be inclusive and I'll just like everything, but they're at war with you, whether you, whether you know it or like it or not. Um, yeah, so I want, to, I want to say about, the, I think drawing philosophers in and saying these are modern philosophers. I mean, you can say that of like Walter Benjamin or some clown like that. But, you know, saying Nietzsche is a modernist or even Heidegger is, uh, you know, it's, you can arguably say they're post or Nietzsche is not strictly, but Heidegger is certainly a post-technology thinker. Uh, but again, a lot of their think thought boils down to it is associated, say, by their spirit of individualism, is what I was trying to say. But overall, applying philosophy to what Greenberg has at the core of modernism is just another way, I think, of them, you know, blowing smoke up their ass and, you know, inflating themselves. 
overall. So again, you can say we can have different terms. People often do say that if you think of modernism strictly, it's we're talking about art, and there are modernist philosophers and writers, uh, but it's something slightly different. So it's kind of a confusing mess. But again, I think I don't know. Have I hopefully not too confusingly outlined a good and bad modernism? <laughs> Uh, I think I'm sure I have. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? I think it makes sense to me. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, the, the point that really sticks out with me and when I was reading your book is, um, you know, is how the critique and the lexicon that they created was so such a powerful part of the mechanism that legitimized the this this crap art that you're talking about you know um to me that's something i always come back to because i think that's i think that's very interesting how how powerful that is you know in basically like we were saying earlier like creating uh, a narrative but it, it is also nice to distinguish between um the modernism the the different you know some of the artists like that you like some of the the movements of that that you like and then the ones that uh, are just complete crap so no i think what you're saying makes perfect sense uh, to me yeah and it all ramped up obviously after world war ii when they really had really tight reins on everything tighter and ever so that was the progression into as that guy was asking into the 50s which were kind of not bad and the 60s which not but not bad i like i said i believe it was after the 80s which was an individual decade to itself recognizable it's like after that, everything kind of stealth, like ossified and things haven't really changed since. And that's a sign that we're trapped in a kind of vortex of wrong think. That's like, we just, it's like a labyrinth you can't get out of. Yeah. So it's well, very, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to say, well, I, to me, the, I know that, you know, it sounds a little bit black pilling when you put it the way that you do, you know, just like, I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, that, that we're kind of almost, it feels like at the end of this uh, cycle in a way, you know, where there just seems to be, we're like in constant uh, degradation, like cultural decline. But I mean, I think that these things are cyclical. If nothing else, you know, it, it it's inevitable that something else is going to come along. People, one thing that's constant is people get tired of the same thing you know, over and over. So something has to give, something has to change. Hopefully it's eventually going to get back on an upswing where, you know, there is really ins a lot of really inspired art. And again, I, I think that kind of thing is kind of inevitable too, that you're going to have some kind of renaissance at some point. Will we get to see, you know, it blossoming? I mean, I hope so. Um, and how much, how much can we consciously affect it? I don't know. You know, it's like, I try to do my little part to, you know, uh, inspire whatever, you know, create, et cetera. But, um, yeah, I mean, well, I think, I think we're doing more than you maybe realize too, because I don't think, you know, think of the average modern person, how often would they even go to a gallery or think of art, you know, it's, it's more and more pushed out of people's minds and where people are more and more online and, you know, you're doing stuff, making, doing this video or doing things like this is a kind of new, I don't want to say expression, but, or art form, but a new thing, um, you know, we're doing something in this new way, uh, sort of despite ourselves are unaware, being unaware of the fact we're doing it in a certain way at, at a certain level, you know what I mean? Right. Um, I'd like, so, I mean, I, like, like I said, in the first lecture, I trace it all back to Greek idealism and what was really any, very good about Western art. Um, you know, and the Greeks really tried really learned that a lot of that from the Egyptians who had such a long series of dynasties and you look at Egyptian art and it was like, you know, it's very good and it's, you know, monumental and amazing, but it was like very much the same for thousands of years. I mean, it changed slightly, but no, not very much. And that longevity, the Greeks really were interested in, and I would be too. So there's a two part way. There's two ways to look at this, which I never really resolved. And I left it open in my book as well, as I recall which is, as you said, the cyclical perennial Spenglerian thing where it's just going to rise and fall and we got to wait for a collapse and then we'll have get a new, a new art. But I mean, along with that, the, the new art would be, see, let me just diverge from there slightly. The new art would be 
what the, what the futurists and them were trying to do, they were forcing something they couldn't really do. The new art comes along and you're only really aware of what it is either after it's done or like you know near the end, let's say. So when you can categorize something and realize it's happening, it's sort of like it's already been happening for a while. So if I'm if I'm right, say in what we're online stuff is a new kind of way of doing art in some ways, you know, even just talking and like making podcasts and things. Or maybe that's not a good example, but like I'm saying something will happen that you wouldn't recognize, it won't realize it's what it is until after the fact, because it's be so sweeping and new, it won't seem like art that ever came before. In the same way that uh, you know, painting's been around for a long, long time. So that's a hard, and that's not a good example. But uh, what's an art? You know, like filmmaking or something. Filmmaking was something out of the blue that you know that you wouldn't even couldn't even explain to someone in the Renaissance. You know, or be unlikely. It'd be difficult to explain. That completely changed everything. Let's say, and it, you know, you don't you get caught up in it, caught up in it, and you're doing it, and then somewhere along the way, you you realize, hey, we've we're a new art form. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I actually think that um, I think, yeah, definitely live streaming and, and just Internet based stuff. I think there's a lot of untapped potential um, that, you know, maybe it is happening. Maybe maybe it is starting to happen. But, you know, maybe people have been doing it for a while, like you're saying. But I just look at how incredible it is. And it's interesting because live streaming is is it such a different beast than you know traditional kind of broadcasting as far as you know w one of the things that people always liked about uh i don't know like take a, a sitcom from like a david letterman he'd have like the man on the street kind of thing you know what i mean people yeah. liked that because it felt interactive even though tv's generally kind of a passive um you know medium but uh, live streaming is really interesting because it isn't passive. Like you can have direct interaction right back with your audience, just like we're having right now. Mm. And I, I feel like, I don't know exactly what it is, but I feel like there's, there is something, there's an untapped potential uh, for a different way of broadcasting that you could use it in an artistic way. You know what I mean? Like to connect people, um you know just the, also the fact that like you could you could technically have people i haven't found the right software for this but you can have people like you know playing music from different places you know what i mean like these kinds of things like there really is a lot of uh amazing potential and and yeah some completely i mean live streaming in a way is an art form but yeah some some distinct new art form could totally blossom out of this area and, and maybe it already is you know like like filmmaking yeah that kind of came out of nowhere and it's just like now it's this hyper sophisticated you know it's been around for what over 100 years now so it's kind of dialed in but um it is yeah. it's interesting to think about it's hard to, it's hard to even think in retrospect like about something before it existed and how even when it was first taking off people would just be like oh what's what's going on like Pluto says to right and all of a sudden it takes over everything kind of thing i, I just realized I never quite finished my point though it was that in like i said in my book there's there's this is the choice that i can't decide what is real it's either that everything's cyclical and rises and falls in the Spengl spenglerian sense or it's not necessarily like that and everything is just like very fiercely controlled and just by merely you know getting control of certain institutions or just changing things we can you know we don't have to we don't have to accelerate or make everything collapse or wait for everything to fall apart to that or it doesn't even necessarily it's not even cyclical it's just a matter of like a triumph of the will of uh you know conquering and um creating your new thing so i i in in the greek sense looking at the egyptians and how long they were if we were to willfully i say the futurists and them tried i think and failed willfully willfully create you know a kingdom and an art form an, an art uh, once more to to rival the Egyptian, you'd have to be something like dated, and it would have to. You would have to think of art. You'd have to be less obsessed with art, certainly less individualistic about it, and have it tied to spirituality and so forth. And it would be like it would be a strict form. Like think of the Egyptian style of art, how strict it was, and how regimental, re regimented, and the same for so many centuries. You know, you might say it gets boring doing the same side profile over and over again, but <laughs> there was there's a longevity and there's a real long-term look at life in that which is something totally absent from us now um which is you know if you could will that into existence you would have to willfully say okay just cut everything after greenberg we're done we're just going to go back 
and start again from Art Nouveau and just maybe we can progress somewhat from there, but we have to be strict about where and how we progress. And maybe you can force that. I don't know. Maybe it could just be done. Well, you know, it's either that or we have to wait for everything to collapse and nobody can <laughs> know or decide. And I don't know myself. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like I kind of, uh, I'm kind of, I feel a combination of those things. You know, it's, it's like, there are these like cyclical kind of waves, but somebody has to shape them in a way, you know, like I, I have mm. just doing what I've been doing with whack on a small scale. It's amazing how much power the curator has, you know? So like the people who decide what gets made, what gets invested in, what gets promoted, you know, like that, that absolutely shapes everything beneath it. And it is, it is kind of a hierarchical kind of thing. It's kind of top down to where, yeah, when you have control of the institutions and you have the distribution mechanism and the money to push something like you can, you can almost make an idea seem like it's coming like from some higher power because people will see it in every single, they'll see it in, in the supermarket checkout line. They'll see it on a bill and in a book, they see it in a movie. You know, it's, it's kind of like it, it's it, they're subsumed by it. You know, they don't just consume the idea in one spot. They're completely surrounded by it and immersed in it and to where they eventually just will accept it. And I, I think that's a lot of what's, happened to us with uh, the bad modernism as far as just the crazy garbage stuff and that infused with these hyper individualist ideas and also you know the ideas of not knowing what's a man and what's a woman and yada 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 you know it's like you just you get subsumed by these ideas and that that stuff is totally unnatural and it all came from it was a top-down push of just people were curating what people saw and heard yeah. and how it was presented. And so, yeah, I, I think that there is there is like a kind of like you have to kind of go with somewhat, you have to ride the wave, which I think they did, you know, in the 20th century. Like there were those, like it was interesting earlier, you were talking about the hippies, you know, like I, I generally have a bad perspective on hippies but you know my definition of it is mostly just like the hey man we, let's just get high and you know like and not and like i'm just a peaceful guy i don't i'm a pacifist you know but there you're right there was a lot of i mean uh there was a lot of great style in that era and maybe and music of course i love a lot of the music from that era so maybe oh. it did just get hijacked you know that's the thing it's like there was a wave and there was like kind of a natural thing happening. People were kind of rejecting the some of the traditions of the past, which that's a fairly, you know, that happens from generation to generation, basically. But then they were able to, the people at higher levels who were curating it and shaping it and had the money and the, the mechanisms, the mediums to to push it in the way that they wanted to go. So basically yeah, what I'm saying. You went from like Jack Kerouac, who was... Uh actually like a Catholic and sort of anti-communist and stuff. And they sort of, they sort of replace him with who's the pedo guy Ginsburg. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he becomes the hero in the, in the darling of the media. And it's like, it's, it's as though he was always the darling, right? Like, yeah, just like yeah. the, the Orwellian stuff. It's like, what, how did the, and they just, that's the power of, of being able to push your message. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's a matter of like, I think it's a matter of having uh, it's will, but it's also like, sophisticated organization you know like having media organizations where people um you know can you can produce something of high quality but then you got to also be able to push it and get it out there and get it in front of people like you said we can write stuff we gotta we gotta find that audience but um writing is the easiest thing to do these days i think to get anywhere with um yeah as much as you can it's one of them like i don't know music I, i'm into music too but i mean i don't you you experiment more with uh, getting, uh, how do you find getting like making a, a living, frankly, or you know, with music? Is it? Oh well, nobody wants to pay for music right now, and mm. and everybody's so used to giving it. All the artists, musicians, everybody's conditioned. This has been driving me crazy my whole life, basically. But everybody's conditioned to just give it away for free. So like, the notion that someone should and and even if it is just digitally out there it's easy to just get it without ever paying for it anyway you know even if someone does try yeah. to charge it someone will put it somewhere on some site and so it's just so hard to just by the very nature of it to make money off definitely make a living it, it's it's difficult you know and i think even the mainstream 
uh, music industry. I mean, you've got Spotify and things like that, but I think they're still kind of reeling from, uh, you know, the whole, the internet and people being able to download. It's just, it's such a different dynamic from having to print vinyl and tapes and CDs. And, you know, they had so much more control over and, and such a greater ability to, to make money off of it. So mostly now I think it's like shows, merchandise. I think that's where at least artists make a lot of their money, but that's, that's a lot of work traveling around and a lot of overhead with that. So it's yeah. tough. It's definitely tough. Yeah. I imagine it is. Yeah. And then there's people just making a fortune, um, playing, recording their video games or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like there's that. You know? It's interesting. Yeah. It's just like people just, and yeah, exactly. There's such, an abundance of uh of media that it's it's so hard to just even grab people's attention and people have a short attention span and yeah it's interesting it's it's like where do you where do you go with it but um uh but let's still see. a need for music most people feel a desperate need and they search and need music especially when you're so online like I, i'm always working on the computer and i often you know i'm looking for music to listen to while i'm working yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think it's it's always going to be there, right? People are always going to want that. I think the trick is um, I'm trying to figure out how to like, you know, a, a way in which we can monetize it, whether some kind of paywall or, or whatever to somehow get some artists paid, you know, so you can do it more sustainably and up the production value and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody did, uh, let's see. So Rick D, oh, and guys, by the way, if you, anybody has any questions, Feel free to drop them in the chats. I got one here from Rick D. He says, what is an example of an institution doing it right? What, as we speak? I guess so. Is there one? I don't know. Um, doing it right. Shit. I wouldn't. I mean, things are like things are really bad. And, and in <laughs> yeah. terms of that, there's people doing like there's individuals you can find here and there doing doing good stuff. Um, an institution. Yeah, it'd probably have to be a historical example, I would imagine. You know, there's people that are good at curating and keeping historical things going. You know, I can think of certain, like, say, ha manor houses around here. You know, there's ones that are, there's ones that keep things the way they were on display for people to come see. Or if they add something on, they do it in the um, style and in honor of the way everything else is. Again, that whole concept that's gone now that's very important, I think, of be being in keeping. With your surroundings um if you're doing interior design or ar architecture or whatever although you know nowadays everything's so crap it's <laughs> it's it's hard to even bother trying to keep you know there's no point trying to keep in anything but if you're in a nice so if you have a row of houses georgian houses and you're building a house you should try to do it in the georgian style frank or something that doesn't look out, r radically out of place so some of these manor houses will put in like a glass tour center and something just some modern crap thing that looks totally out of, you know, we're talking about beautiful old architecture, you know, basically castles, you know, with big gardens and they almost ruin them with, they put, they put in some modern sculpture or some tourist center thing and they screw it up. And there's other ones that do it, keep it well and um, keep it in keeping and so forth. So I can, you know, I can think of that little small example, some, some of them doing it well and some of them not um, like an institution. I, 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 unless you can think of something i can't think of a major institution um no i mean the only thing i can think of and i yeah. i hesitate on this because i had a number of critiques but uh the northman i feel like like mm. hollywood or or fi the film industry kind of only gets it right on accident like occasionally yeah. but yeah. i mean there was a lot like that's a movie i mean people are going to go see movies like it's definitely worth seeing um yeah. Yeah. You know, it's but uh, I mean, I thought that was done pretty well. I think it would probably be way better if it were done by someone who had a greater reverence for that history and felt more connected to it. I mean, I mean, to me, that just makes logical sense. So, it, you know, it, it I mean, as far as I understand, the, the director Eggers is a pretty hardcore shit lib. So I don't even yeah, understand. I don't even understand how like how they can even even attempt to like take things from the past given their worldview you know so like it always it always feels disconnected to me but but that's kind of them accidentally kind of getting it well enough for people to go see it and not be like completely insulted by it i think you know, but <laughs> yeah i wonder who who produced that i wonder i didn't actually ever who did who was the producer or who was the studio that oh it's um focus features 
Oh, his features. Okay, so maybe they're maybe they're okay somehow. I don't know. Maybe they're they're very art house. They did. Uh, I mean, they've done a bunch of stuff since. But another one I liked of theirs was Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. No, oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't bad. Yeah, it was good. It was you know, it's there. The thing I think. Yeah, the thing about the Northman for me was that it it felt like it was done by like a some a, a people who normally do stuff like that. Like Eternal Sunshine's like a. You know, it's a very um, moody kind of uh, art house film kind of. And I, it, I don't know, it didn't have quite the punch to it that I would like in kind of an action movie like that. But, but, but anyway, it's still, you know, that's again, that's not a great example either because I just feel like they just, every now and again, they accidentally kind of make something decent and it's not, they weren't really doing it right. It just kind of slips through, you know. <laughs> so in the modern era, yeah, there's just like almost no examples other than, like you said, maybe some like some small examples of like some historical societies or, or what you were talking about, people doing that kind of thing. But the broader yeah, but, institutions are awful. So, yeah. And there's a, such an overall sort of malaise of this trap, you know, keeping things cornered so nothing gets out of bounds. I just think when and when and where it appears, it'll be something so radical you won't even recognize it as art at first. And it'll be sort of I don't know. My feeling is it'll be that, that we need there, we're really we don't even realize how trapped we are mentally, really, how, how we've been slowly tra trapped. <laughs> and th if there's any kind of breakthrough, it'll be something quite just astounding, I think. <laughs> and um yeah, it'll probably involve some kind of disaster too. I, I don't know be yeah. after the disaster i don't know but you know i can't see i just think overall there's things are very ossified and stuck so it's hard and most people most almost everyone like a majority of everyone would have i'm not saying they might listen to what my what i was saying and, and totally object but they would sort of come away with it and still would not be able to recognize or see art that they know or historical things that they know about and really look at it more objectively or reverse how they've been trained to think that art is really pure individual about expression and nothing else primarily expression individual expression and how you would think of it otherwise um you know and maybe the whole system of creating art from all that period from when we were living in caves and uh, or you know mammoth bone huts to now is somehow over and we're going to evolve into just doing crazier memes or something <laughs> i don't know i don't so, know so uh jack white i know we've kind of touched on this a little bit but uh his question is does brendan think it possible to return what is his vision well that's what i said i don't know i'm not sure um i really don't know maybe it's possible i mean anything's possible um if you return though i mean what would you do what strictly do you what point do you return to how do you return um you'd have to it's possible to say if everyone agreed with what i'm saying and we rejected everything most of what happened certainly since the since the 80s and reject the um excusing of greenberg that occurred in the early 20th century i mean then what do we do then what do we do we go with a kind of stricter realism in painting and we try you still have to find something new out of it and maybe that could be done maybe you could just one thing one step i would do is restart the guilds the uh, craft guilds for an all in all the in all the uh, art disciplines and beyond i would really go back to a guild system and that would help really get things moving you get people organized in a system hierarchically uh towards these idealized goals of finding a new aesthetic finding a new style of you know maybe painting maybe photography has kind of dealt a blow to painting that'll never recover from but we're always going to need buildings and we're going to need you know aesthetic machines <laughs> and things you know so uh, you know these things aren't just going to vanish we will need ways to do them properly there's a whole there's a whole that's the whole trouble and the balance you have to find between what technology has changed about the world and the way the necessities of human life that aren't really going to change like transhumanists think they're going to somehow escape the material and just upload their personality and just vanish and don't, don't have to worry about anything you know live forever on the computer but it's obviously horseshit and they're going to be we're all trapped in the material and need to make a necessity and necessary idealism of it 
to make it as good as we can and make it better for the future. If you think, like I said, in that un-Heideggerian way, not that, not that Heidegger wasn't also a genius, but um, in the way where you think of the past and the future and think of like a, a continuing bloodline that's beyond your individual uh, personality and soul, you think of trying to achieve that ascending arc um, and how you might go about it. But, you know, a lot of these things are how we could go about it now when we're so trapped is difficult. If maybe there was like a mass, huge mass of people agreeing with and clamoring and saying, yes, you're right, let's start the guilds or do some of this, you know, but really, you know, that's we're, no, we're nowhere near that now. I mean, what, you know, maybe a few hundred people will watch this and that people probably already agree. <laughs> Right. Uh, not not to say that most we maybe we'll go viral somehow and like yes I'll get like a thousand messages saying you're right let's I'm ready or like what we need is a you know a billionaire a millionaire to, to, if there's any millionaires watching this you must contact me we'll set something up <laughs> yeah the I mean I'm with you that's I really like the idea of reinstituting the guild the guild structure I mean uh, I hate this hyper individualistic do everything yourself you know, like you have to have, you have to be an apprentice at some point, you have to be able to have some kind of a, a mentor who can help you at, or at least an organization who can help you get to where you need to be and get some resources and free up your time. So you don't have to night manage like a Chuck E. Cheese in order to, <laughs> you know, like uh, yeah. do your painting on the side. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like you've, there's so many incredibly talented people who's, who just like, you know, have to end up doing whatever it takes to get by and live their life and have a family, you know, and it's, it's like, it, it wouldn't even take that much to just have better organization and a structure to where you could really develop the skills and get people the resources they need, you know? Yeah. And you have to have a commercial um, element there and, and intent. See, you're really good at that kind of thing. I think you're good at organizing things. Um, you know, that involve organizing people and like getting money involved or whatever, you know, like actual events and things that say, you know, there's a real skill in that. That's the kind of organization uh, skills you need with like with an intent, with a commercial goal, because, you know, any guild, you know, if you're if you're, if you're in the pottery guild and you're making your Delphware or whatever you're doing, you know, you do have a ultimately commercial goal. Um, I mean, it was weird with the guilds because they did, they were commercial, but at the same time, they were totally focused on ascension in their specific art um, by a tier they set for themselves, not just by the audience demand or not the uh, commercial demand. Uh, it's a strange and excellent way to go about things, I think. <laughs> it's not that where we do it now, where we have these marketing people, you know, try to determine what the average idiot is looking for next, and he doesn't even know or care, and like some fool just makes some shitty Marvel movie or something. Yeah. everything's dour right and pointless yeah and like a lot of people will go consume it like the next product but it it uh, i think everybody has a sense that it's just this cycle of culture that isn't actually fruitful it's not it's not a real culture it is just a product you know but yeah i, I totally agree i i like the idea of if uh you're yeah you have the guilds you have the art sector or whatever like dedicated they have their role, so they're not they're not lorded over by the business people, the money people who are just you know who just want to make a product that sells a lot and make as much money for as little expenditure as possible. So it's it is tricky, but um, and yeah, I mean that is what I'm ultimately trying to do with WAC is like yeah, get try to get people. I mean, I wish we had the you know enough funding to to do what we're talking about to like actually try to organize a you know in that way to where you could actually like develop people and de develop artists and get them, you know, that's, that's like the, the big, big, big time dream. Obviously we're uh, a ways from that because it, it is so massive, but you know, like at least we're trying to do that on a small scale when and where we can. Well, there must be a way someone must know a good way, or there must be like a, an art to approaching uh, fabulously wealthy people and, <laughs> You know, pitching them your yeah. crazy, crazy idea, right? Your crazy well, guild idea. You know, if someone, someone knows has the skill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
Well, and the thing is, it's not even that crazy, right? I mean, it's been done in the past. It's it's like a time tested thing, you know. And I guess yeah. just like other things, it just kind of uh, it got lost to time. And then, of course, you know, with like uh, the modernity of of uh, mass production and like hyper capitalism and everything, the concept of uh, you know the arts being taken that seriously. And, and then of course they destroyed the legitimacy of the arts with what's happened in the last hundred years or so. So yeah, it's, you gotta, it's almost like you gotta convince people that the, to take the art seriously, but you gotta have artists who actually are real and good and serious artists to do that. So. I mean, well, you'd think... be surprised. You'd be surprised too by the amount of people that still do believe there's a very bourgeois class of people, say champagne socialist types, let's say who, really do believe in the art they see in the Guggenheim and the, uh, you know, the person pulling the, uh, pulling the sausages out of her vagina or whatever, you know what I mean? They actually yeah. do convince themselves it's top tier art. And, uh, you know, there's not, there's no shortage of them to be honest. So there's a good few. Yeah. No, well. you're right. That's, uh, that they're out there, but Hey, you never know who, who knows who might hear this and, um, you know, yeah. Who knows? Who you knows what know. might happen? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me let me see if we got any other questions. Uh oh, let's see. Oh, Jack is saying that Elon Elon Musk needs to buy whack next. <laughs> buy what? <Yeah. laughs> I think he's busy. Family. I don't think he's interested, and he's not interested in uh, art. I wouldn't say. Yeah, he was kidding. Maybe I'm Just wrong. Kidding, but yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. I think Elon seems like kind of a technophile. Um, I don't know if he has any interest in the arts, and I think the the jury is very much out on what all of this is going to mean with him purchasing Twitter. I'm hopeful that you know it'll at least go back to some semblance of I don't know if neutrality is the right word, but you know, fairness, uh, maybe, but who knows? Who knows? It would be nice to just see people being able to speak more freely on Twitter. I mean, I think, you know, but anyway, yeah. But uh, funny comment, yes, Elon buying whack. Um, 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 my ears are open. Sure. <laughs> you just put out an appeal, like, um, I remember I did that once as a joke. I said, if there's any millions millionaires out there, I made a tweet. Contact me right away. And some guy did contact me. I don't know if he's a millionaire. And he did nice. give me some uh, a bit of money. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. yeah. But he was like, okay, how much do you want? And I was like, is he joking? Or... <laughs> um, and so I didn't I, I didn't even... Um, I should have asked for a lot more. Obviously. I should have like, written up a plan. And uh, I just did... got... I, and he like, you know, he, he's like a patron of mine, let's say. But like, you know, not, not, not enough that I can do anything more than I'm doing with it. Like, Right. Maybe I could ask him for more and say, "Well, I, I'd have to have a plan." Right. I'm not even sure what the story is, though. If he maybe maybe he is like a, you know, maybe he could. Maybe maybe I yeah. should say something to him. Maybe he's watching now. I don't know, but uh, could be. Yeah. What, I mean, I'd have to have a, I'd have to have a plan. Like, how would you go about creating? I'm too wishy washy myself because I can't say anything certainty with certainty. I can't even decide if it's like we should be accelerationists or we should be, you know, trying to uh, revive Egypt. Right. And so I'd yeah, have I mean, to, I'd have to really think of what I would do. Right. No, that is, I ask for money. That is the thing. Yeah. You got to have a plan. <laughs> you got to have a plan. Um, that's, that's the trick of it. It's like, Oh shit. But I guess like, even if it is, you're even if we're in a situation waiting for collapse kind of thing, you do have to, you always have to try. Even, um, Evelo would say that. And Spangler. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think personally, my kind of view of it has always been, that regardless of what happens, it's good to be building something. If things really are just disintegrating, you know, culturally, et cetera, then it's good to be building something now, even if you can only get it to, you know, small, small kind of levels, it's at least you've got some kind of head start as far as like, you don't want to wait till things completely, completely collapse. Cause then kind of like what we're saying, then you don't have a plan. You don't know what, even know what you need to do. You don't even know who do I need? What do I need to train them to do? Where do I, how do I organize these people? You know? So like to personally, I think it's always good to at least be like striving for something, something, you know, so that you're not just like waiting around for things to fall apart. But, uh, 
and then yeah, yeah you have to try you do have to try and like i would um yeah we i don't know you'd have to if you if, you get, if some if someone has any idea what if there's so there's him and there's maybe i'm sure there's others if you just make an appeal but you have to have a an actual pitch and an idea and it has to make sense right i did have an idea to maybe make the dream god into a movie and there's a guy who made a movie who was even gonna help me do a um a synopsis for it which is really a stretch i think you know and i was like okay what well, you know but I, I i even said i did say it to this guy and he said sure show me it and uh we never actually finished it we i must, <laughs> I must try and finish that but i don't know like is he going to is he going to just get, say give us you know a, here's a couple million for this movie idea you just cooked up you know i i don't know it seems like it seems like a stretch but yeah i mean that does that doesn't find if we're talking about something really what what you would do what you would have to do in terms of art you have to pick what art we're talking about your focus on music i was formerly focused on painting and stuff now i do more writing and things but you know you have to figure out what medium you're talking about you say if you wanted to create assist in a revival of painting somehow i don't know what would you do buy buy galleries and or buy a school or just do online classes or something. No, that's not good enough. See, I'm not sure there's any way to penetrate. You know, you can never get to the Guggenheim level of control here. Maybe you could though. I don't know. I'm too. I just. I'm too indecisive. Obviously, I can't. <laughs> I can't even finish the sentence like decisively here. Well, actually, whack. We we have a lot of musicians that not. That's kind of our focus, just because that's what mostly what we get, and we've that's kind of where we started because that's where the most people were producing. And I think also because I'm a musician and that also led us in that direction, but technically we're open to all kinds of, I mean, any kind of medium of art, but yeah, realistically, you know, there's only so much time in the day and it's hard to kind of work and do things for all of those various areas. You'd have to have people well-versed in each of those in each of the various mediums for one thing to be kind of like the stewards uh for artists of that type and to like think of projects ways to develop just like you're saying yeah if, if you were going to focus on painting like do you just go and start your own galleries do you you know how you get you gotta you gotta bring artists up you gotta you know you you kind of have like an apprenticeship program for aspiring painters you know stuff like that i mean yeah there's a lot of a lot of different angles you could take with that um it's a big yeah in your case you'd be more like maybe if you went around scouting talent and you found someone who was just super popular and you'd be like the brian epstein character <laughs> yeah like with the beatles yeah uh, and just like he has to sign it sign away his or like you know <laughs> you've got a contract with him that he does everything through you yeah that would be a way yeah. he or her maybe what it if she if they were really popular somehow like some kind of viral yeah know. i mean that's that's kind of a possibility i mean we've talked about you know like a record label type entity um or like kind of a production company so that's kind of the some the directions that we're leaning in we've got some irons in the fire on that front do you have like some kind of open submission thing where people like submit to you their work and say look at me like yeah we we play we get we've had a lot of people contact us if 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 it's something that's kind of immediately obvious like uh like we got a poetry show that nolis does so like yeah we try to get people like featured on that or people send us music and we play it on you know some of our streams as in our saturday night live stream and then we got a couple other music streams um so yeah stuff like that people submit stuff but even that you know with with not having like a full uh, staff and things like that, it is it becomes very difficult very quickly to even deal with the intake of people contacting us. Like, I apologize, there's people out there I've never responded to because I'm like, I'm not quite sure what to do with this. You know what I mean? Like, where, how can we help this person? And I have done a lot of connecting people and trying to get collaborations and we try to feature them and encourage people to create, but, uh, there's just it's just uh it's a massive undertaking you know right. and it's it's hard it, it's easy to get unfocused very quickly <laughs> so yeah we do we do play a lot of music we've got our spooky shorts film festival and i i want to expand on all those things you know but it's just like 
you'd, you'd have to have like a paid staff and, and people heading up all of those various areas. Yeah. But somewhere, somewhere in your inbox out there is the next Justin Bieber. And you don't even know it yet. No, uh, I probably okay. just went <laughs> glazed right over it. You know, you would if it was someone like him. Actually, <laughs> I probably like would fuck like, that. Eh. It's not worth any amount of money. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. But uh, all right, I think we've probably covered our bases here, and I don't think anybody. Uh, uh, and it, oh, um, there is one more question from uh, Rory Herbert is wanting to know if Brendan is related to Amber. Huh. <laughs> I'm guessing yeah, she's that. my cousin. No, <laughs> I don't know. It's an un unusual name. Um, it's from Cornwall, I think. Or South Devon or something. Uh, it's around that area in England. So probably distantly. It's, un it's unusual. You don't hear it though. That slut. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But uh, all right. Well, thank you, Brendan, uh, for coming on here to give this uh, talk, this lecture. I think it's very fascinating stuff. And I, I think this kind of thing is a step in the right direction, as well as the other stuff we're doing and you're doing. And speaking of that, so you've got uh, something. You just released a new pulp book, if I'm correct on yeah. that. Yes, science fiction. It's kind of magazine thing. And I'm going to do come out with it every three months from here. Or try to and hopefully i'm sure i will for you know for as long as i can i guess um Aegean, yes it's called and it's like short stories science fiction short stories again like yours i i get submissions from people and, and uh, publish them but the first one i wrote most of it even some of the you can tell i'm sure the uh the names i invented are me too but there's a few submissions in there as well i just wanted so i wanted to control it so much and have the stories a certain way i couldn't resist like and i probably will continue to write a lot of it <laughs> and pretend i'm other people just why not but um <laughs> there's, people are submitting and there's a lot of stories to go through actually i do have like quite a few to read for the upcoming ones and everything but yeah it's out now you can get it um i have still have to put up the um kindle version i'll do that soon and actually i'm going to put up a hardcover of the art book which i'm talking about here as well pretty soon which i haven't done yet hardcover and is that stuff available to go to Amazon? It's all Amazon. Yeah, yeah it's all on Amazon. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, where where can people, you can go to Aegean, Aegean slash sci-fi.com or Aureus slash press.com or look at my Twitter, Aureus Press, and you can find the links to Amazon and everything's there under my author page. Awesome. That's great. Great to see more uh, books like that coming out. I think um, fiction is a great way to go. Uh, it's just nice to see more people producing stuff like that. So that's very, very exciting. So congrats on the release of that. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, you get sick of not being able to find the stuff you want yourself. So you said, oh, fuck it. I'll make it myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly. Well, all right, uh, guys, thank you for watching. And uh, we're going to be back next week with another one. We're going to do another part two. Uh, this one will be with Dave Martell on hyper romanticism part two. And that one that will actually be discussing uh, horror specifically. So it's going to be interesting. Oh, sounds but, good. Uh, yeah. So join us then. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>